right, so why don't you introduce yourself and tell me what you got going on. Oh, my God. Well, my name is Patrick Lacey. Uh, I am a horror author. I guess I've written, uh, I don't know, like nine books at this point. So uh, novels like Dreamwoods, We Came Back, uh, Where Stars Won't Shine. Uh, what else? A Boy So Soft. My newest uh, release was actually a re-release of my first book, which was a short story collection uh, entitled uh, Sleep Paralysis. So that came out in 2020. Um, and then since then, I've kind of been working on my newest novel that my agent is taking a look at right now. So it's, that's who I am. Mostly. Okay. Do you mostly concentrate on full novels or short stories? I've seen you done a lot of uh, collections that yeah. you're in. I kind of broke into uh, writing through short fiction, which I guess is, is pretty typical of a lot of writers, especially genre fiction. Um, and then over the years have kind of turned more. It's funny because I used to like when I would when I would write a novel, it would always be like very, very short, basically like a longish novella. And now from having written more novels, I kind of have the opposite problem. So like right now I'm, I'm actually writing a short story while I wait to hear back from my agent on something. Um, and I'm finding that like I have a hard time keeping it short now because I'm right. so sort of in the world of novels and I've had to rewrite the thing I'm you know working on a handful of times. So now it's kind of like more in the other direction where I have a problem like keeping it short, which is funny because I just never if I could talk to like, you know, 10 years ago, uh, Pat, I would be like, you're it's the exact opposite. So I didn't obviously see that coming, but I kind of have fallen in love with the novel format. I like you know, getting to know the characters and stretching out the plot a little bit more. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like started in short stories, but it's definitely in longer format now. I have a hard time with short stories too, especially like the ones that are like 3,000 or 5,000 words. I'm like, how are you going to get across a backstory and multiple characters and events? So I, I find myself cutting out stuff that I'm like, dude, I really like that part. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's kind of what I like about short stories is that a lot of times you don't need the background, um, especially if it's like, you know, let's say like a 2,000 or 3,000 word short story. I don't really need to know like the, where the character went to school and what their grandparents did for a living, um, which is oddly specific. Um, I'm not even yeah, talking yeah. about that. I mean, like like if you saw the movie Robocop. Yeah. So, you know, how the main character gets brutally killed, like, you know, yeah. these long, violent scene. So um, Verhoeven, you know, Paul Verhoeven was the director and he yeah. said, you don't have time to get used to the backstory in this character. So I want as brutal an execution as humanly possible. So the human sympathy kicks in and you go, oh man, he's a decent guy. Look what they fucking did to him. Yeah. And then you feel connected. So I was even talking about like a long backstory, like those like 70 novels. I'll spend like half the novel just <laughs> telling you about the backstory. <laughs> But I'm just yeah. talking about like something that kind of like feeds into the character so you feel more empathetic. No, I hear you. I mean, Robocop, I actually just rewatched um, the Blu-ray of that not that long ago. And I was actually struck by that. Like you only have one little tidbit of info about it's Alex Murphy, right? Is the character's name? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that, like uh, something Murphy. I know yeah. I know Murphy is like his tagline. And like right, his partner yeah. is always, oh, is that you, Murphy? Is that you? You know? Yeah. And I think like he just mentions that his son like watches some cartoon and he's like trying to learn like the spinning motion oh, of the his spinning, gun or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's like an old cowboy thing. Yeah. Yeah. And they, that's that was a like clever mean. addition too. Absolutely. Yeah. Because of course that's, you know, Robocop's signature move is when the gun comes up, but that's all you get. And that's all you need with that character is you just know that he's trying to impress his son and he's, he's a family man. And from yeah. there, the plot happens, but then you contrast that to the remake, which I think is like 2012 or whatever. Um, I thought they were it's just, horrible. <laughs> it's, oh, it's terrible, but it's so much background to the point where, like, I think it even opens with, like, the family eating breakfast, and you see right. all this, like, you know, interpersonal stuff. It's like, we don't need that. We just need enough uh, of the character to kind of see where they are. And then, you know, throughout the movie, or if we're talking about novel or whatever format, you can start to sprinkle in, you know, more things about the character. But I agree. I don't like giant info dumps where the novel or the movie or whatever opens up and you just know all this like historical context about the character i just want to like get in kind of get a feel for who they are and then you know get the plot moving especially when they're not really connected because like the remake of robocop has all this stuff with him fighting in afghanistan and getting blown apart <laughs> then he comes back and now he's like super cop but in the first one it's like the very people that did that to him that's who he goes after 
Yeah, so, and I wonder, you know, because if I think that was, I want to say that was 2012, but regardless, it was post streaming, and I think that's kind of an effect of streaming is with longer format television, you know, eight, nine, ten episode of like a mini series. There's a lot of room to breathe and kind of, you know, have more characters in it and have plots and subplots and sub subplots. Whereas a movie that's in 90 minutes, you don't really need that. But I think that's kind of a, a side effect of, you know, people streaming such long content is that they kind of want that. But if you condense, you know, these long, intricate plot structures into a 90 minute movie, you're going to run into trouble because it's just not it's the, the real estate is not there to do that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. It, it, it feels like it, my impression is it has kind of gone backwards. Like it used to be that they take full on novels and they try to shorten it down to like a two hour or less movie. And now they're taking like, you know, like novellas and they're trying to stretch it out into like a nine episode Netflix series, you know, and it, it works when they like, like, I don't know if you saw Lock and Key based off Joe Hill. Um, I haven't Sons. seen it. No, I mean, I've read the comics, but I've not seen the adaptation yet. Well, I've read the comics, too, and the comics are better than the adaptation, but it is a very good adaptation. And it's like, it's such a long, intricate story that, like, crushing it down into, like, you know, nine episodes, it makes sense. But it, it's not like a short story they try to extend out into nine episodes. Right. Yeah, something like that it's better fit for a longer form. So I'm not, I'm not like anti longer form, although I do find myself watching less, you know, shows these days, just because time, I have a two year old. So time is like very valuable to me. Right. So I definitely have kind of, you know, I only have so much time to write. So that kind of takes like precedence. So in my like, just, you know, free time watching, I'm definitely like more movies at this point with the occasional show, if it really like sucks me up. But, um, yeah, I mean, when she came along, it was kind of like something has to give in order to continue to get stuff done. Um, and so I felt like longer format stuff was kind of the way to go on that front. But I mean, you know, she goes to college and they'll probably catch up on everything I've missed. So <laughs> I don't know. I, I find movies like I get bored. Like maybe I spoil now, but I get bored after like the hour and a half mark. Whereas if it's like a Netflix series, you can watch a one hour episode and then, you know, you know, more is going on, but it's like, that was a, a good chunk of information. Yeah. So, I mean, I find myself, I agree with you. Like even with uh, like, I started watching a movie today. I just had a spare 45 minutes. So I watched half of it. It's like a 95 minute movie. Um, so I find myself um, interestingly enough, splitting movies up into two or three and sometimes four, if I'm falling asleep sessions, um, which is kind of like, you know, the the length that an episode something would be anyway. Um, so I think I've just kind of fooled myself in thinking that, like, you know, streaming shows are more of a commitment than they actually are. I think I've just kind of like, bring, I've gaslit myself into believing that. It's a, actually a fair point. Okay. Uh, so most of what you focus on now are short stories. So, you know, like, like I, I did a collection of short stories and they, you know, one was picked up for like one of those like Black Mirror shows, you know, or Twilight Zone kind of shows. Unfortunately, it never went anywhere. Otherwise, they'd be rich. But, uh, you know, but, you know, are you doing are you focusing on more short stories or individual tales or are you focusing more on the longer novels or are you doing both? Um, I've kind of taken a shift towards novels. So like I said, my agent has a novel that I've been working on right now. I just did kind of a partial rewrite for her. So that's kind of the thing that I've been working on, you know, for a couple of years at this point. Um, but I've had some shorts, uh, you know, sprinkled throughout the last couple of years. I want to say like five or six. Um, it used to be much more often. I feel like, you know, five years ago, every month or every two months, I'd at least have one or two stories coming out. But I, I definitely have kind of taken the shift into longer format. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like one of my short stories was Options um last year or the year before uh for an anthology film and the director of my segment had to back out unfortunately but now that has kind of stayed at the same production um company uh and has been assigned a new director hopefully with the intent of making it a feature so i've looked at the treatment so far um and i have not really heard much more on that but it's, it's just interesting to see like you know, they've Did they changed. ask you to write the screenplay or to be like an advisor on anything? I, I was, I guess you call me a creative consultant if you want to. <laughs> so I definitely, uh, and I use heavy air quotes with that. Um, <laughs> I definitely took a look at it and it was just fascinating to see like it was completely different than the short story. Because again, this is what we're talking about is I think the short story was like 
3,500 words, kind of hard to stretch that out into 90 minutes. So they definitely like gave it more life and gave it, you know, uh, more plot and even a bigger theme than I had sort of intended when I wrote it. Um, Was so it a good theme? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's really, really good. They went in really, it kind of has like a, a Hellraiser-ish vibe, a little bit of weird fiction going on, uh, which is my jam. Uh, yeah, so it's like completely different, but it, it also like keeps the main plot points sprinkled out, but just adds a ton in between. So I was kind of like, um, you know, really impressed that they did that because that's something I struggled with, especially starting out as a short story writer is like, if, if I needed to make something longer, I was always like, well, how can I do that? Like there's only what's there on the page is what's there. So I'm always sort of fascinated about if someone needs to, you know, take something and make it longer and have to add plot points and characters. Um, that's not easy as I found out with, uh, you know, the novel that I've been working on. So I was impressed. So I don't know, like I said, as you've seen, you know, things fall through, you know, I think they say like just under 1% of films uh, actually get made from inception to actually getting on the screen. So, you know, you have to kind of, hold out hope until it actually happens but uh fingers crossed for sure because it's definitely an interesting um treatment that they gave it well i know plenty of people i mean there are people that you know their stuff gets uh, adapted into a movie or a series or and they just keep going like it like it's nothing and there's some people once that gets made they don't really do anything after that they yeah they almost like step back and retire like like i'm a big fan of uh mike mignola he invented hellboy and you know all his hellboy stuff was awesome right up until he got signed and then it came out in movie format and now he only like occasionally writes it occasionally does a cover but other people write and do covers you know like the hellboy stream keeps going but i don't want to see mike mignola's hellboy and i just don't see that right yeah i i don't think i'd have that problem i mean this is assuming in some like wish fulfillment sense that something were to get actually made and then make a bunch of money um i think i would still be doing what i'm doing because i'm not very good at I'm not, even though I just said like, you know, I watched a movie today, that was just because I had a rare like 45 minutes in between things, but um, I'm not someone who can just like sit still. Like I always need to be working on something. I'm pretty harsh on myself that way. Um, so like, even like we went on vacation, uh, my, my wife's family has a, lays a house in the family on, on Cape Cod. So we go there a couple of times a year in the summer. Um, and I was supposed to just take, you know, a long weekend there and not work, but I still, you know, grabbed my laptop uh during baby naps and stuff and work i'm just i'm always piss her off no she, she's fine with it. um because <laughs> then she can just do her own thing and i'm not bugging right. her. um but yeah i don't i don't really know how to like i can relax but i can't relax until i've like gotten something done writing wise and that could just be like editing something it could be uh outlining something or kind of running stuff through the idea mill if that's a thing if that even makes sense but i have to feel like i got like something done uh, I, I it think it totally even... makes sense. I mean, it, I like whenever I write anything, I take a whole bunch of notes. So yeah. I'm like, oh, these are all ideas I really like, but of course they're not all going to work together. So you have to go to the idea mill where you like plan what's going to work with what, what's, you know, what's compatible, what should I remove? Right. Yeah. And, and I, sometimes I will feel like, even if I just kind of worked through an idea and just got a very very like sketchy outline sketchy as in like rough draft not like sketchy like that would get me in trouble um but <laughs> uh, just to clarify but yeah i mean that i will i i still consider like i think i was listening to some podcasts recently and they were saying like 85 percent of writing is not done at the computer but it's done like when you're driving to work or you're running an errand or you're in the shower like thinking it through um oh, and i have actually, some that, that would be good oh i was just gonna say like i think that's true like i I find myself like if I'm writing, you know, I can usually only go for like an hour and a half ish straight before my brain just starts to like melt out of every pore in my body. Yeah, I hear you. Um, Same here. Yeah. Enjoy that visual. So um, then I kind of need to take a pause, but I, I'm still thinking like my mind is still like moving parts around um, and it might not even be on a conscious level. So then like the next day when I go back to her later that day or whenever, um, I'll come up with something that I just didn't, I had no idea was even in my head at that point. So I do think it's like important to, um, you know, be kind to yourself if you're not like, if you run into something like tricky plot wise, or you're just kind of not, you know, whatever you're getting on the page that day is just crap um, to just kind of take a break. And I find that like something, you know, the gears keep turning. Sometimes they'll come up with something that's not that great. And I'm like, well, that didn't do me any good. But sometimes it really does surprise me. And I'm like, where did that come from? I wasn't actively thinking about this. Right. So, 
No, yeah, like I, I think I follow kind of a similar pattern, you know, with, with uh, what makes me the most comfortable is like I'll, I'll write and then, you know, it, I mean, it'll be anywhere from like, you know, 45 minutes to like, you know, two hours at the very most, you know, where then I get kind of tired of it. But when I reach a roadblock, you know, I don't try and push it too much because it's going to be crap. So I'm like, I'll just walk away. And then like I go for a bike ride or I go for a run. So I'm doing other stuff. And meanwhile, I'm thinking about the next plot progression. And I always come up with the best ideas when I'm not sitting there trying to force it. Yeah, absolutely. And that the, I found that the opposite can be true as well, where you can have this like awesome two hour session and then you like, you know, go do something. And then while you're doing it, you're kind of trying to figure out what you're going to write next. And then you're like, holy crap, like I, I screwed up on that last part. Like I need to go back, trash it. Cause I've now like ruined like three chapters down the line. Well, uh, I will, I will neither, you know, affirm nor deny that I've done the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's why I definitely used to be more of a pantser. I think I was someone who was kind of like, um, you know, I don't want to say like snickered at someone who did an outline, but I was always like, doesn't that kind of take some of the magic out? But now, um, having kind of like worked with my agent so far on, on the thing that she's looking at, um, I, I just kind of now want to switch to outlines or, or at least a loose outline because um, I can just see like, you know, writing a novel or being, you know, let's say selling a novel based on an outline. It feels like it would be safer to at least kind of have a sketch of a roadmap where you're going if you're going to spend like three, four or five months on a draft. Um, no, I whereas, I don't know. I, don't, I just feel like maybe my novels have gotten a little bit more plotty. And I think that's kind of a dirty word for some people, but I'm totally pro plot. Um, plotty. <laughs> plotty. That's good. It's it's in Call Miriam Webster. It's in there. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely more like into like the next thing I'm kind of planning out the for the book after this. I, I, I'm actually like trying to, to outline it. Um, so I don't know. It's just another thing. Like, again, I started out with short stories and kind of grown into novels. And I started out as more of a pantser. And now the idea of at least kind of knowing where I'm going is very appealing to me, especially because time is just uh, super valuable these days and scarce. So what's the next project you're working on? So the thing right now that's with my agent, I don't know like how much I can actually talk about it, but it's a, it's a horror novel. Um, it's a little bit more funny than, I, I don't know. I, sometimes I'm like not good at examining my work. Like sometimes people will say like, oh, this novel was super funny. And I was just like, really? I thought it was like kind of grim and, and dark. So to me, it's funny. I don't know if that just means that I, I you know, the grim dark sense of humor, which is which is absolutely true. Uh, but I guess, <laughs> you know, it's about like a, a down on his luck uh, ghost hunter who through a series of strange circumstances is kind of called back uh, to the hospital where he got um, a, uh, a surgery when he was younger that kind of made him able to see ghosts. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's completely different than my other stuff. It's what I've been working on. I started writing it uh, summer of 2020. So it's definitely like the thing I have worked and I've taken breaks and written other things from it, but off and on for, you know, just over two years, I've been working on this one thing and it's been, you know, it's been straining in some ways just because I've always been someone who just wants to like produce and get to the next thing. But it's just so different now than it was in its initial stage that it's kind of, you know, interesting to see all the achievements of it. And I can kind of look back and see like it's really something different. And I'm glad I took the time to do it. Um, it's just been a completely different process, but it's definitely been extremely rewarding because like I said, it's it's not like anything I've written before. It's definitely kind of leans into the joke a little bit more. Um, but I mean, there's still like, you know, monsters galore and there's a, there's a little bit of murder. So it's not like Do I you have a spot. name for it. Uh, it. It's we have like several titles that we're working with. I don't know if I'm like supposed <laughs> to. Not yet. We'll, just, not yet. <laughs> we'll call it Project X. <laughs> Sounds well, maybe that would be the official name. Project that, X. that would be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I recently uh it was like a six and a half hour long seminar, but I watched a seminar from Alan Moore. And yeah. uh, I really like Alan Moore's writing. I think it, it has a very tight style and it's heavily researched. And um, one thing that he does, like when he wrote Watchmen, which, you know, won a ton of fucking awards. And I, I think it's really well written. Um, what he did is he creates kind of a loose storyline. Like he knows more or less what the plot's going to do, where it's going to go, but he doesn't want to interrupt that magic so you know if while he's writing it he wants to add something or change something he can do that but he kind of knows roughly where it's going and he says it helps a lot and he also 
he'll build things like uh, a lot of it takes place in Manhattan and he lives in the UK. So he built a miniature scale Manhattan. So he like place characters in it and see like where they see each other and you know how many blocks they have to travel and all that stuff. That's that seems like a a, a large amount of effort that I I'm <laughs> well, I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying that's what that's what he does. Yeah. He, he also talks about like uh, one thing that you know everybody's already always said, and I I've done it before, and I forget about it, and I do it again. Um, about reading your stuff out loud. Yeah. Like if you read for sure. your stuff out loud, you really see how it sounds and how it flows and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it helps if you have an audience, you can read it too, because they can give you some feedback. But if you don't have the audience, at least read it out loud. Yeah, no, my, my wife writes too. She writes YA. Um, and she came up with like through poetry. So she kind of did a similar thing with poetry is shorter form, obviously, and is switched to writing novels. But so we'll sort of read our, our whips, our works in progress. That's what the kids call them um, to <laughs> each other. Um, and it's funny, like sometimes I'll just notice how bad something sounds because it's usually like the rough draft that I'm reading. And like, as she's about to sort of point something out, I'm like, I know, I just caught it reading it out loud. So yeah, it definitely, um, or like I'll start tripping over my words. Like I'll be really tired and I'll just like hate what I wrote because it makes it sound 10 times worse. Um, but I have found that like just on a syntax level and like the, the way that the sentences flow, my eyes will just not pick up certain patterns or certain repetitions of words or phrases unless I'm reading it out loud. And then I'm like, uh, why did I just use the word bombastic several times? I've never, I don't think I've ever typed out bombastic but now I, I may have to after saying that yeah I, I think my first novel i wrote um i used the word ochre a bunch of times people were like why are you using the word ochre <laughs> so many times i was like i didn't even realize i used the word ochre that many times but you don't even realize sometimes when you you make like a sentence like syntax errors and so on and then you read out and you go oh there's supposed to be an and there or a the there it, it doesn't flow if i don't have that or even like occurrences, uh, to your point, I was at a con maybe five or six years ago, and someone brought a copy uh, of Sleep Paralysis, actually, but it was the first edition. Uh, they brought it to me to sign, and it's I was, you know, at that point, it blew my mind that someone would bring a book that they all, because like, you know, it's pretty standard to buy the book at the table and get it signed, but this person has clearly like, you know, proactively bought it, so that was great. So my ego is feeling, you know, pretty high up. And then I sign it. Uh, and she was like, you know, I really liked this uh, collection, but I noticed like a pattern that I wanted to bring up. I hope you don't mind. And I'm like, no, please shoot. And she said, I notice almost every character, like in at least like three fourths of the stories in here, um, when they get scared, like really scared in, in a strange situation or something that's like unfathomable or they're running from, you know, a ghost or a ghoul or whatever. Um, you always describe that they have a full bladder and that they're going to that they're going to pee themselves. And I was like, that's, there's no way that's true. Um, and then I literally- It turned out it was. <laughs> uh, so I want to say like, yeah, 12 to 14 of the 18 stories. Um, some people had just full bladders all the time. No one was going to the bathroom before uh, spooky stuff happened. So that was uh, kind of invaluable because out of all the things you want to be like, you know, known for, I, I don't really want to be like the full bladder guy. Um, so <laughs> I have not used that since that was pointed out. Um, so hopefully nothing slipped through the cracks that was already in process, like about to be out there, but I, I make well, a conscious. If I effort. see you at a con, I'll be like, it's the full bladder guy. <laughs> it's the full bladder guy. I mean, it could be worse. I could be known for worse things, but, um, yeah. So you never really know. Cause you're like so close to it. Um, I just hope there's no other embarrassing motifs that I've not picked up on so far. We'll see. Someone will let me know down the road for sure. Uh, yeah, well, somebody will definitely let you know because there's lots of fucking Karens out there. They'll let you know about <laughs> everything. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Like, yeah, I've had people like message me and say like, oh, I found a typo in this book. Uh, and also like, did you want to like restructure the syntax of like this? Paragraph? <laughs> and also while we're at it and I'm like, well, the book, I mean, the book is in print now. So like the typo could, was like an of and it was supposed to be an or, or something minor. So it's like, I'm not going to lose sleep over that, but. You know, at this point, the the syntax notes are sort of, uh, you know, they're not as valuable as they would have been, you know, uh, pre-publication. Okay, also, you're not a beta <laughs> reader, but thank you. Thank you as well. <laughs> well, I, I, one guy, I just did the Necronomicon, and uh, I had one guy come, he's like, I love the way you write stuff. I'm not sure if I liked your novel. 
<laughs> like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> I like, like the way you write stuff, but I'm not sure I liked your novel. <laughs> I'm just trying to, like, because on paper, I see what you're saying, but the more I think about that, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to need time to process that. I think I see what they were saying, but that's sort well, of a and, well, and I, I tried to get out of it. I mean, I, I don't want to be a douchebag. Like, dude, my, my writing's awesome. You know, I was like, hey, man, so, <laughs> what, you know, what didn't you like? Uh, what, it's like, well, I'm, I'm not really sure. It just, you know, it kind of like, I didn't know where some of this stuff was going. You know, so it, it, it's, and, and I've had people read my work and they'll love one part. And the rest would be like, oh, it's okay. A lot of people hate the same part that somebody else loved. Uh, you know, oh, so yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's why I don't read reviews of my stuff anymore. I definitely used to, like, you know, and I think that's kind of healthy when you first start out because you are getting feedback, you know, but it's not like a writer's workshop or anything. But you will kind of get feedback and you can, you know, take that however you want. But um, I just, yeah, I've stopped reading them, even the good ones. I'll, I'll just like when someone, it's kind of like out there, I've done my job. And then I kind of just want to like move on to the next thing. And also it's a weird thing where like, I don't want, um, I don't know. I don't want something, even if it's like a glowing review, if they say that they like a particular thing about my writing, I don't want that to be in my head for the next book. You know, like, I don't want them to like, no, that's understandable. Yeah, because yeah, like fall back on that trope, and you know. Yeah, yeah, like I don't want them to like unconsciously like influence my work moving forward, if that makes sense. And I don't know that that would even be a thing, um, but I'm, I, I don't know. Like I'm so neurotic about certain things that I would worry that <laughs> that would happen. So I've just stopped. You know, sometimes it's inevitable, inevitable that someone will send you like one, and that's fine. But for the most part, I don't like go out and Google myself. So. <laughs> Well, at one point, um, speaking of erotic, um, anything that I don't know 100% on, I want to do research on. Yeah. I really don't want to be called out or something. <laughs> and I was at the conference, and there was a writer, and he was like, yeah, I never researched anything. I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, I, I've always found that, like, some a lot of people will be like, oh, I don't like to research, so I'll write a book that doesn't require research. And I... I get that but all books require some research like you you should just always have google open just to quickly look up a fact or whatever um because you're just going to come up you're going to come along things in the plot where you don't know uh if this car like what year this car was produced or like you what, know what, what roads year. connect what roads and yeah you know. absolutely and and it just usually i find that it's not i don't need to like you know gone are the days where you have to be like huddled in a like a a dimly lit, um, you know, library uh, basement. That doesn't make any sense, but I'm sure libraries have basements. Um, you know, like researching stuff. <laughs> they, they just do. open up yeah. Google and, or another, you know, Bing. You know, you <laughs> could use Bing. I don't. I'm not sponsored by Google, but well, um, I use Google Earth. I'm like, you know, to pl plot out like road trips across. <laughs> yeah, US. I'm no. like this went to this and this and you know. Yeah, I used to like only do um, fictional towns for that reason because then you can kind of you know. <laughs> I, I would, <laughs> yeah exactly but then people would be like like, is like this just... Maine, they all take place in maine but they're all like <laughs> you know towns you've never heard of in maine <laughs> well no the people would be like is is this just salem and i'm like yeah yeah it's just salem they're like why don't you just call it salem then and i'm like okay so like the since then like the last couple have been set i think uh in actual towns that i've lived in i've only lived in three towns so i don't have a ton to, to pick from uh but yeah i just found that people wouldn't realize they're like this is this is danvers with a different name you know what i mean they would just kind of figure it out so i've kind of um just changed it to real life and i don't need to like nobody needs to know like your back roads that you take to work but it's just helpful uh I, you know what what do they usually say like you can research a ton on a book, but you're only going to use like 10 or less percent of that. But it's good that you know it in the back of your head because right. that can kind of like dictate, you know, where you take the plot with it, if that makes sense. No, it, well, yeah, and that's kind of my feeling with like seminars. Like, you know, even if the guy is like kind of a mediocre writer, but you learned one new trick in the seminar, you're like, it was worth it. Because For sure. You learned one, one new thing. Yeah, and that's why I like... Another thing I used to kind of like um, turn my nose up at when I was in my 20s, not my 30s, when I was a very young person, um, it was that, you know, similar to like the the pantser versus the outliner, is that you should read outside your genre. Because I was mm -hmm. like, well, I mean, horror is what I want to write and horror is my jam. Um, 
But over the years, but a, you also you know, don't fall into the stereotypes that everybody uses. Absolutely. And sometimes I get a little bit burnt out on horror because I'm just reading like the same sort of tropes, like you said, over and over. Um, so it, I, I have found it like way more. I find that like every time I read a crime novel or like, a, I don't know, a sci-fi novel, I'll pick up more things that I actually apply to my writing. And I couldn't give you even half of the example right now, but just trust me on this, um, than I would <laughs> if I was reading another horror novel because I'm so steeped in that because that's kind of, you know, where my heart is. You can see half the room um, that uh, I'm not like if I'm reading a horror novel, I'm probably not going to pick up on a lot of that. But if I'm reading something that's slightly outside my comfort zone, like I got a lot in, more into like crime and noir during right. the pandemic just because I had a little bit more reading time. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I just find like reading outside my genre, I'm able to like steal different like um, kernels of things and sprinkle it into the horror. And it just makes it feel like a little bit fresher, I guess. Yeah, well, I feel like the, I feel like the best is when people kind of mishmash genres, like, you know, it'll be a horror story, but it takes place in like the wild west, you know, or it's yeah. like, a, you know, or it's a horror story, but it has like, like I generally I like a dark tone. I wouldn't even say it necessarily has to be horror. I really don't like the the slasher thing because I feel like that's overdone and boring unless you do something new with it. They're like, that was just a crazy guy who kills people. It's like, well, there are lots of crazy people in the world. You know, I, I want I want something that like tells me something new. Yeah, I, I like kind of the genre mashing too. Um, someone who I've been reading recently who does that great is Benjamin Percy. Who's a you know he writes Wolverine and Ghost Rider, but he also okay. writes novels and he has. Um, I guess you call it a series. It's called, it's under the umbrella of like the comet cycle. So I think the first two books are out and the third one's coming out soon ish. Um, but the first one is like sci-fi mixed with like a little bit of horror mixed with like dark fantasy, I would say. And the second one leans more towards horror, but it's got like, you know, sci-fi elements and like um, even some like spy type stuff. Uh, it's just interesting that he, it, he throws it all into a blender, but it doesn't feel like, um, Force. alphabet soup yeah, yeah it doesn't feel forced it just feels like he likes all these genres and he's just mixing them up so much that it's just its own it's a new it's like when i was a kid in in crayola you know the crayon company they would do like a create your own color thing and it would right. always be like kind of blue but it's its own thing enough to right. be called like sapphire gummy worm or whatever um <laughs> i don't know i that might be way off with the name uh you can google it or bang but um <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. I'm just reading it. And I'm not thinking of it as any one novel, but I'm also not thinking of it as like a mashup of of um, of genres. So he does it like absolutely seamless for sure. I've been digging his stuff, and his comics are awesome too. Yeah, well, I find like uh, like my favorite movies would be in, like instead of like uh, Friday the Thirteenth, which I, I refer to Friday the Thirteenth as like Jason is like the best character in the worst movies because <laughs> it's like. I mean an undead uh, rotting zombie, but the movies are fucking terrible. Oh man, see, I love them. I, they're near and dear to my heart. But, I, well, uh, I, I've seen all of them, so I'm yeah. not. I'm not saying that they're not worth watching, especially right, right, if you're right. a fan. I'm just saying, I mean, pretty much like you know. All right, if you run, you're going to trip and be killed. If yeah. you have sex or you smoke weed, you're going to be killed. You know. <laughs> But there, I, there's something comforting in like knowing the formula and knowing where it's going to go. It is like a chicken soup, chicken soup for your decaying soul. If you want to, if you want to, <laughs> those people, that company that publishes those call me. Um, but I, I think that there's like a comfort to those kind of movies. And sometimes I actually don't like when movies take um, a certain trope and try so hard to subvert it. No, I, I, know like, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Yeah, they're kind of like winking at you, like, look how smart and satirical right. how we are. How clever we are, you know. Yeah. They're like, yeah, yeah. fuck you. It's not yeah, a good and story. That, that was like that was sort of a side effect of Scream. Like I actually as a child, as a child, I mean, I guess I was a child when that came out, didn't kind of get the meta aspect of scream because i was kind of too young to like pick up on it so i was never like that into it and I, I wasn't as into it until i watched it many years later and i loved it but i think a lot of slashers saw like oh my god this movie's meta let's just be meta constantly and they didn't understand that like that movie was meta for a specific reason like the mood like the plot itself 
relied on sort of the references to horror movies. So I right. feel like that's an example of where a lot of slashers tried to just one up the meta-ness until like, it just feels like they're constantly winking at you, which I don't like. And it, the, you know, the same thing happened with like Tarantino in the mid nineties. Like everybody had to have like this hyper, you know, right. hyperactive dialogue and stylized and using. It's got to be gritty. It's got to yeah, be violent. Be you know? It has to use songs that are ironic or in an ironic yeah, fashion. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. Like so very, it's very like, hipster ish. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Whereas like Tarantino's just doing that because like that's just what his thing is. So right. I feel like there's always like, you know, the four runners are, uh, of a certain type of trope or genre or formula. And then, you know, everybody wants in on it. So they just kind of like amplify it until it's just like this bloated version of what it was never meant to be. If that right. makes sense. I don't remember what we were talking about, but I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I think we're talking about like trends <laughs> and people sticking with trends instead of doing something yes. original and new. Like, right. like, I, like some of my favorite horror movies are kind of like horror sci-fi, like Alien. Like the first Alien oh, is amazing. Sure, yeah. yeah. You know, and yeah, I, I would say it's way more horror than it is sci-fi, but that sci-fi element really brings out like the, the weirdness and strangeness and the isolation. Yeah. So that's what I love when they mix up genres. But sometimes they mix up genres and it's just it's a shit show. Like no, I don't know I, if you saw Cowboys versus Aliens. No, <laughs> was that Daniel Craig? Was that no, no, um, I think uh Harrison Ford was in it. Um, okay. but yeah, it's not good. Don't watch it. I, you know, I wasn't planning on it, but from <laughs> this, I'm even more not planning on it. Um, yeah, no, I like the space horror thing. Like, I think uh, I remember there was like something going around Twitter a couple years ago that said that like space horror wasn't a thing. Like, they said that if like they called Alien like just sci-fi, they said that you could not have space horror. It was this bullshit. bizarre it was bullshit. This, yeah, well, clearly, but it was just this bizarre movement. But like, I love the two like. I love Event Horizon. A lot of people hate that movie. And that I movie. liked Event Horizon. Yeah, I was going to bring that up too. Huge Aside fan. from that one element where it looks like Hellraiser, like with the people like uh, on pillars and around, they're like, well, if you're a chaos dimension, why would you have a hell that looks like Earth? You yeah. Know, I aside, mean, aside from that, it was amazing. Like when yeah. they find that the the ship, the Event Horizon, like floating, what was it, Uranus? Like, uh, or Neptune, just like Neptune, floating. yeah, yeah. And, and when they they come down, it's like this massive ship and this you know fog and void. It's like it felt intimidating. Yeah, I mean, I've always found because they you know tons of stories about that movie being like cut to crap on the editing floor, and supposedly there was like a VHS. Like they lost the actual like film stock of the stuff that was cut, but there was like a single VHS uh, that the director maintained and he wanted to someday like get the studio to release like the director's cut, but then that turned out to just be an urban legend. Um, so there's all, I like kind of like the lore behind that movie because they think it's just a movie that like for the majority of it does not make sense and like totally is all over the place, but that's part of like the reason why I like it. Um, I thought it made but there's, sense. I've seen the movie a bunch of times, but I, yeah. I think it makes sense. Oh, the best part in that movie is like when they first see there's like video left over from the former crew and they're all like, it's just quick cuts of them like eating each other and like cutting each other up. And, stuff, and yeah. then it switches to Lawrence Fishburne and he just, and I think this was meant to be funny, but he just goes, we're getting out of here. And it's just like <laughs> the perfect comedic timing in a movie that's like not, not really <laughs> meant to be funny. Um, yeah. So yeah, I love that movie. I, I I watch it like way too often. It's yeah. just worth it. And I love Sam Neill in anything. Oh, sure. he's great. He's great uh, um, at the Mouth of Madness. Um, what was it called? Uh, or in the, the Mouth, Mouth of Madness. In the Mouth of Madness. Yeah, yeah so I, this is like blasphemous and I get a lot of flack for this, but that is legitimately, and I'm not saying this to be uh, contrarian, even though I kind of am one in nature. That is my <laughs> favorite uh, Carpenter movie. I okay. love that movie. To well, it's very death. Lovecraft. I'm a big Lovecraft love fan. It. So I love it. Every part of it. And I think that's one of those movies where I, you know, I'm always like weary of leaning on nostalgia for things because I could watch like something that I loved as a kid and I'm like, oh no, I don't like it anymore, you know. But that's a movie where I think I saw at the right age. Like certain movies, when you see at a certain time in your life, you can't separate them from like the nostalgia. They're just like embedded within you. And I think that's one of those movies I just like, there's nothing about that movie that I dislike. Like I could watch it every day. Well, maybe not every day, every other day uh, for the rest of my life. I love I, They Live too. Like I, I thought oh, that yeah. was that, like so broke boundaries. Like 
I know he has like his famous iconic movies like Halloween yeah. and the thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and I think the thing is a great movie, but it, they live struck a special chord with me, you know, in the mouth of man, just struck a special chord with me. Yeah, I mean, I like a lot of his, um, I'm just looking at my like shelf to see if anything jumps out. Like Prince of Darkness is one of my favorite ones of his. I don't feel like that doesn't get a lot of love. Um, well, I know I that even... he made like a trilogy, I think, in the Mouth of Madness, Prince of Darkness, and one other movie. Um, the I wasn't a big fan of Prince of Darkness. Yeah. Well, I'm closing <laughs> right now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I think it was like his end of worlds trilogy, like unofficial trilogy, but it was just because the world was coming to end. They weren't like obviously, you know, narratively uh, related or anything. But yeah, I mean, I like uh, even movies that people of his like. I love vampires. I think that's that's a uh, excellent movie. I like, I, I like the vampires. Uh, I liked it better, but I didn't think that the vampires is one of his best movies. No, I wouldn't put it in like top. It's it's mid tier Carpenter, I guess. But right. I could watch any of his movies maybe a set like ghost of mars is pretty rough that one has like a bad <laughs> reputation and i was always like kind of a defender of that because i'd only seen it like you know when it came out which i, I guess i would have been like maybe a freshman in high school and at right. that point you just watch it you don't have opinions when you're a freshman in high school um uh, although now today with twitter i guess it, people were born with opinions but um back then i was just like oh cool there's space vampires uh, and I had gotten the blue of it whenever that came out, like a few years ago, and rewatching. I was like, "Oh, this is this is hard to say that this is a good movie." So that one's tough to get through for sure. But I love Carpenter. He's probably my favorite. Nightmare on Elm Street is my favorite movie. I know that's not Carpenter, well, but I that was that Wes Craven, yeah, the Wes Craven. So like, that's my favorite movie, any genre or anything. But my favorite filmmaker is Carpenter. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There, there. I I think there were a few people that made like spot on, amazing, iconic horror films, and they never really did anything that good again. Like Toby Hooper did Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre is amazing. Yeah, but he never sure. like I've seen a bunch of his. I saw one of his movies. It was so fucking horrible. I can't even watch it. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's had some. Yeah, he's definitely never rose to that again. I mean, I love I love Fun House. Um, I love um, Texas Chainsaw 2. Obviously, it's like completely different, but I love that. That was uh, actually the first one I saw. When I saw that as like a little kid, I was like, holy shit. I saw the, the second one first as well. Actually, the, the first one, it was one of those movies that I just like didn't see until I think I was in high school or it may have even been early college, which is weird because I've been watching horror movies my whole life, but it was just one of those things I just never caught it um same thing with like uh rosemary's baby and a couple other like movies that you would think as a horror fan you like you would start out with i would like start out with some of the bigger ones but the second i got like disposable income in high school i would kind of go like I, I remember getting like a uh a dvd like two two for one type deal with demons one and two um and like killer clowns from outer space which obviously that movie is like much more known but in like 2000 definitely was not it was much more of a cult film so i remember like trying to seek out things that were lesser known and that's how i found out about like dario argento and lucio fulci so all that is to say that i missed out on a lot of like top tier classics because um i guess i was a horror hipster is what i'm saying when i was younger <laughs> so i wanted to get like the you've never heard of this band but i have you know checked off so there was a handful of movies that I just didn't see that were like bona fide classics until later on, which is kind of interesting. And the first Texas Chainsaw is one of them. Yeah, it took me a little while to see that. Um, I remember what got me hooked was uh, like I was 12 when I saw Evil Dead 2. And after I saw that, I was like, that's it. I'm sold. Yeah, I um, I started young. My parents, like, so my <clears throat> mom was a nurse growing up um not her growing up when I was growing up she wasn't born a nurse um but my dad was a stay-at-home dad he was an artist but he, he had a studio at home so he worked at home so he was always like you know in the summers or if I was home sick or whatever if my mom wasn't home I would just be like can I he would take me down to the video store and literally he just didn't care um he was you know had been a hippie in the 60s early 70s so he was just kind of like open-minded he did not care so he would rent me like total recall robocop like any chuck norris action film the recall is an awesome movie too oh my god i, I love total recall uh, i haven't seen the remake Arnold. i heard the remake is not good i don't think i even saw like there's some movies that you just know you shouldn't remake um <laughs> like so, yeah, RoboCop. <laughs> what's that like robocop like robocop unfortunately <laughs> i got tricked into that 
had bought into the hype. But yeah, um, and so he would let me see like anything. So I remember literally being like in kindergarten, um, watching all the Nightmare on Elm Streets. And I remember being like terrified, but also like I wanted to see them again to kind of see, <laughs> see why. It, which is weird because I'm not a thrill seeker. Like, um, <clears throat> like my wife wants to, uh, we've been talking about this with uh, her side of the family. Like we want to do a Disney trip when uh, our daughter's a little bit old. I've never been to Disney. I don't really like theme parks. I don't like anything with rides. I would never like skydive. I'm just kind of like a boring person. Like even getting me to like leave this basement takes some effort. Um, but with horror movies, it was like, even though they terrified me when I was younger, I wanted to like relive that being scared if that makes sense and kind of figure yeah. out like why it scared me um so yeah like literally like four five six seven i'm watching like all the jasons chucky <clears throat> um a nightmare on elm streets and then um i'm telling the kids at school like what they're about because the kids never are like found oh, chucky really terrifying he's like no, he's a fucking I mean, doll yeah i know the first one like scared me a little bit when i was a kid but by the second one he's full on just like a comedian <laughs> with one-liners but um so I'm telling that the kids, most like, horror movies. <laughs> well, that's fair. Yeah. At that time, post break <laughs> too. But I'm like telling the kids what the plots to these movies are because they're just so forbidden in their minds. And I'm just like making stuff up because I've just always been like, that's kind of where the writer seed started is I would stretch the truth about like what these movies are about to the point where it's like, yeah, Jason like rides a killer whale and then has a kaiju battle with uh, whatever. Um, but then like the- is it, in there somewhere. And... Yeah, in the background. Um, and then the kids like tell their parents and their parents, like my, my parents end up getting a call and being like, you know, you can kind of let him watch whatever he wants, but can, can he not tell like, can he not tell the entire class all of the kill scenes from like, you know, uh, Jason, the new blood, for example, um, or whatever. So, yeah. So that was kind of like, I started very, very early. Like my dad would just, and, and to the, like, my mom didn't know about this until recently. Like I brought it up. I, I just like casually mentioned some Chuck Norris movie, I think that I'd rewatched recently. And she's like, Oh, when did you see that? Um, cause I said it was a rewatch and I was like, Oh, you know, dad, let me watch it when I was like five and just the look of horror on her face. And she's like, <laughs> well what else did he let you watch and i'm like literally like i saw death wish too when i was like you know before i could like say my abcs but that's probably stretching it but um so i like definitely started early with that which was nice because that kind of like cemented like like genre was huge in my house like especially for my dad like um if it was like a sci-fi action western more western for him I, I, mean, I don't care too much for westerns or horror like it was it wasn't like um looked down upon or like it wasn't a so bad it's so good it was like holy crap this has a like a spaceship on the cover and it kind of looks like there's like a knockoff so you know morph let's rent this and like let's watch this so that kind of like planted the, the you know, love my dad saw alien in the theaters when it first came out he was like oh, big really? into sci-fi yeah 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 he's i never saw sci-fi and westerns and military because he's military so like oh, every gotcha. like I saw Apocalypse Now in the theaters as look I was like eight years old. <laughs> that's that's a tough one. To go through, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I I'm trying to think. That's a good point. I don't think I saw because it was. I think it was literally like my mom wasn't hadn't caught wind that I was watching all these things that I most certainly shouldn't have. So <laughs> in hindsight, like my dad would if I were to be like, can I see? Um, uh, Jason takes Manhattan in the theater. He would say no because he knew like three months down the line when it came out to VHS, we would watch it anyway. So in hindsight, I was kind of like, I wonder why like I can watch these movies at home, but he won't bring me to see them in the theater. And then like, you know, time and distance has shown me that it's just because he didn't want to get in trouble with my mom because I'm not supposed to watch <laughs> stuff, which is kind of interesting. So yeah, I didn't see anything like cool or forbidden in the theater until I was like of age, I feel. Well, I remember my mom would... Uh... Like she would take me and buy me the tickets to go in and see whatever I wanted. And then I remember I went to see um, Friday the 13th part seven and they said, no, you can't just buy him tickets. You have to watch it with him. And she refused to watch it. So <laughs> I didn't see seven and eight, but I've seen every other one besides that. <laughs> in the theater, like during the original run. Well, yeah. Well, I, I saw a three in the theater. I saw a four in the theater. I saw a five in the theater. I saw a six in the theater and then seven was the one they tried to make her watch with me and she yeah. wouldn't watch it. And oh, then I didn't see seven and eight. That's awesome. Like I've not, you know, I missed out on that. Like we have a, um, 
a kind of old, I don't want to say old timey because it's going to make a theater. It's going to make it sound like it's a prohibition era, like uh, theater. Uh, but it's just like an older theater uh, in Boston called Coolidge Corner. And okay. they have a program called uh, After Midnight that's on, I think it's every Friday and Saturday. And they show older, a lot of times it's genre films, but they usually are showing horror at least a couple times a month. So I've gotten to see like original 35 millimeter prints of like um, Troll 2 and Freddy's Dead and Videodrome and all sorts of cool stuff. So the I've seen the original. An awesome movie. I love what is it? Drum. Troll 2? Videodrome. Oh, yeah. Videodrome. Um, yeah, that was the, I think that was the first, uh, first movie I saw there actually. Um, and it's cool. Cause they'll have like old, um, like they ran like some random, like Pepsi ad from like 1987. Like they'll just show random stuff before. So it'll kind of stick with the genre, you know, like, yeah, the time yeah. Period and all <laughs> exactly. that. yeah, it's awesome. But, um, uh, I haven't been able to do that cause they're all midnight screenings and I am just not like the older I get, like, I just, I'm so tired that like, I think the last movie I saw was, um, what was the last movie I saw there? Jack Frost, not the Michael Keaton one, uh, but the, the spooky, uh, you know, snowman one. And like, when I'd seen get it up in the morning. If you're so tired by uh, midnight. What time I'm usually up. So I work from home. So I'm usually like, I start my day job around like six, six thirty. And a lot of times I'm doing my writing beforehand. So sometimes I'm up like before five. Um, wow. So yeah, I'm, I, I, I guess like I'm a morning person by default because I have to be, um, but it's not easy. It's definitely tough. So, but I, I don't know how people do it. Like I have some friends in Philly um, that do like 24 hour movie marathons and I just can't fathom that. Like it makes me just tired thinking about it. <laughs> um so yeah i haven't i haven't seen one of the movies in in um uh, too long but maybe i need to do it again and just like i don't drink red bull but maybe i'll just bring a thermos of red bull and just see what happens well i get up at 10 30 so i usually go to sleep you know way later so <laughs> right right but that's early for you though right so you must still be tired at 10 30 it's just a different time for you well i get up at 10 th i like i own a tattoo shop so um you oh, know okay you know, I, I've been in there tattooing till like midnight. So like yeah. it's, it's a later schedule. They don't even right. open till one o'clock. Gotcha. So I'm just on like a later time schedule. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear that. Yeah. I don't know. It's, I, I would like, like, even on the weekends, I'm just like so used to waking up early that I'm like, like six 30 would be like late. Well, you for also me. have kids. So yeah, she, that's one thing that I never realized. Like, I thought kids liked to sleep in. Like, no, I, I must have missed this this part in the birthing class. But I just, like, think back to when I was a little kid and, like, I would just like to sleep. But my daughter is, like, you know, I'm lucky if I get up and there's, like, 15 minutes of quiet time before she gets up. And she's not, like, allowed. She's actually a sweetheart. She's been kind of a joke to raise so far. Um, but I'm just shocked that she wakes up that early. I'm like, what is happening right now? You just, but I guess it makes sense though. She goes to bed, she sleeps like 12 hours at a time. So I should not be complaining because I've talked to other parents who they're like, I haven't slept for a decade. Um, but I'm just for always a decade. <laughs> what probably literally. In some cases. Um, so yeah, I am just like, I am always waking up around the time that the sun's going up, but that's okay. I sound like I'm complaining too much. I shouldn't. <laughs> it's my right, damn it. <laughs> So when you write, do you need to be in absolute silence? Do you have like a, like kind of a man cave you go to or a basement? Yeah, it's, it's this, this is like my home office. This is also where I do my day job stuff. Although I blur the background for meetings um, just so people don't ask. Although what's funny is like when I blur the background, uh, we use Microsoft Teams for you know chatting and meetings. These guys right here, um, the, the filter or whatever on the meeting program will pick these up as faces so I'll always just be talking and I can see in the background, these are like peeking in and out of existence. And I can always see people like wanting to, to mention it, but just don't, which is funny. So I'm just like, well, I'm not going to mention it. The ball's in your kind of you awesome, but yeah. the mummy on the wall. Um, but yeah, I, I, I need silence for the writing stage. If I'm editing, I can kind of put music on and I can have my daughter in the room and singing little mermaid songs as one does. Um, but I can't, if I'm like, <laughs> if it's a blank page and I'm starting from nothing, I need, I need just my tinnitus and nothing else. Just, just quietness. So yeah, I, I have tinnitus as well. I have a ring in one ear, but yeah, me I, too. I, I chemotherapy and I think that's what it is. Oh, yep. 
I, you know, mine is not nearly um, from something like medical related. I stepped. So it's interesting. I um, was like in bands through high school and then uh, I went to college for audio production uh, with music stuff. So they always said like, wear your earplugs. Um, you want to protect your inner ears. So I would always have spare earplugs uh, on me and I was waiting to pick someone up. So I stepped into a bar just to quickly get, I think I literally just went in to get a Coke because I was tired. I don't think I was, I was designated driver that night. And I stepped in and I ran into someone I knew and there was the, this jam band playing. So I was at this place for 15 minutes at the most, but this place um, was not meant for live sound. Like it was not created with live sound in mind. So it was all brick. So when sound hits, you know, wood, it does absorb it a little bit. But if it hits something like metal or brick, it just shoots back. It just ricochets and everywhere. Um, so I was just in the right place, at, or I guess the wrong place at the wrong time. So I blew, <laughs> I blew my eardrum. Um, and it was funny because it was like um, when I finally like saw it, because to see like specialist ear doctors, um, you may have had to deal with this yourself. It takes like forever to get into one. But when I finally saw one like a couple of years ago. Who, oh, like, yeah, I've done that, yeah. Yeah. And so I had to go to the Boston Children's Hospital because like kids have a lot of, you know, ear things that are really specific to kids. So I saw this guy who was basically like a pediatrics ear guy who who specialized in that, but also saw some adult patients. So it was very hard to get a, an appointment with him. But I remember when I went in, I had a Goosebumps shirt on and it was all these little kids and then like some some army dudes in like fatigues. And I'm thinking like these guys probably were near landmines and that's why they're having ear issues. And then so like this guy, when I finally see him, he's hearing all these awful things and he has to talk to these soldiers who have, you know, probably seen action. And then he's like, how did you get tonight? How did you wreck your ear? And I was just like, oh, I just saw this awful jam band that I didn't want to see for 15 minutes. And then it was just, oh, okay. <laughs> That, that's uh, a sad story behind it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's just like, you know, it's not like I saw, like I've seen Slayer, but I had earplugs in, but it's not like I can be like, yeah, I went first front row to see Slayer and that's how I blew my eardrum. It's like, nah, I saw this crappy jam band that I stopped in for 15 minutes and forgot my earplugs, but that's all it takes sometimes. It's crazy. Well, I saw a whole bunch of punk bands back in the day that was probably <laughs> it was way too loud. So yeah. I mean, that might have been the start of it, but uh, I had brain cancer and chemotherapy and uh, that kind of like put the nail in the coffin right there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not, mine's like not, it's weird. Cause like they say the best thing about tinnitus is just to think about it. It's actually pronounced tinnitus, which I'm always like that. I'm not calling it tinnitus. It's tinnitus. <laughs> um, but, I did not uh, know that. Yeah. That's the medical, like, uh, phonetically correct way of, of saying it. Is and nobody will know what the fuck you're talking about. Or tinnitus. <laughs> tinnitus or tinnitus. It's not like the common person calls it, but we're going to, we both know how to say it. <laughs> no. But they say, like, um, just picture it as background noise and it, you kind of, like, don't notice it as much. But I find that mine, like, changes throughout the day, like, pitch. So, like, in the morning, it's not too bad. But after I've had coffee, like, you know, caffeine kind of makes it a little bit worse and it like changes pitch. So it's like how you're supposed to like get used to background noise if it's like changing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like mine does that. It goes up and down. And, yeah. You know, sometimes um, it blocks out more. And people like I'm like, my hearing is not that great. But then you'll yeah. hear like certain key words. And I'll be like, oh, you can fucking hear. You're just pretending you don't hear. <laughs> you I'm like, that. dude, sometimes you hear more, sometimes you hear less. I'm sorry. Yeah, mine is weird because it's, um, I forget the correct term right now, but it's like uh, uh, certain frequencies are lower than others. So right. like um, below a certain frequency, I, I, every, it's as if the, the volume has been turned down by like 20%. So like I can hear like, um, like I could hear a trumpet fine. Go, I wouldn't want to because uh, that would probably <laughs> give me more tonight, but I can hear a trumpet fine because that's like higher up. But like bass sounds kind of weird. Um, but I don't know, like other certain things that are too high sound weird. It's just like it's like my hearing is like um, mixing and matching things that sound off. So I, it's always keeps me on my toes, uh, which is not a great thing, I guess. But at least it's not at least it's not boring. Right. Could be worse. <laughs> could be worse. Yeah, absolutely. And you can always make up an elaborate story like, yeah, I was in the trenches and, you know, <laughs> the mortar went off and, you know, I can barely hear. And Yeah, you know. I mean, it's much it's a much better icebreaker uh, or party conversation than, yeah, I saw this crappy jam band in, in, near bricks. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, yeah, like I said, it, it, you're a writer. You can make any story you want. Hey, there you go. There you go. All right, so I, I don't want to keep you here all night, but um, I want to ask you one more thing. Um, sure. So when I was really, like I was watching um, the Alan Moore seminar, which, by the way, I advise anybody to check it out because he is really a fantastic writer, and he goes into a lot of depth and a lot of stuff. Like he kind of starts out as like, you see this face? This is what 40 years of commercial writing makes you look like. <laughs> and then he starts, and then he starts into magic and you're like, Oh yeah. He's, he's like uh, a wizard. Now this is going to be kind of weird, but he actually, what he's talking about makes sense. He's like uh, our earliest form of communication was writing. A lot of people couldn't read. So it was kind of like magic. So it, it all like, he, he he's clever enough. He makes it work. Um, but what I was going to is, um, so he talks about writing in iambic pentameter, you know, it kind of like, um, kind of almost do it. like he's like Shakespeare did it. If it's good enough for Shakespeare, it's good enough for me, <laughs> you know, and, and he talks about like, you know, but the rise and the fall of sounds and like using a certain amount of words, you know, per sentence, like kind of like the um, iambic pentameter trope that you use, um, but that, that just makes it flow better to the eardrums. You know, do you consider that in your writing at all? Yeah, just in terms of like the syntax and like, because I, I do like, you know, coming from somewhat of a musical background, like I do kind of find that writing is like a little bit musical. And, and I find that like if the same, if all the sentences are the same setup or the same length, it just gets boring to the eye. And I remember I had an English composition teacher in college who said like give your readers a break like just think of their like eyes as they're going through you know split things up into paragraphs um and then change the sentence structures so i do sort of try and like if i've had a run-on sentence or two or three run-on sentence for example i'll try and chop up some sentences or have some smaller sentences to just kind of like slow it down um just like if you would see a sound wave or like right you know like a song if you're running through pro tools or something like you know, I, I think of it as a sound wave and I think of it, you know, if something's like too jagged, it's just going to be harsh. So I do right. kind of like to switch up the flow of it for sure. Um, and I feel like comics are like that too, for sure. I mean, you, you know, by, you know, whatever, like page three, I think they say, or page four, you're supposed to have the big splash page to kind of like, you know, um, convey some big emotional kind moment. Of the rise and flow. So, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So I totally, I mean... <laughs> If Alan Moore says it, it's probably a, a correct thing <laughs> for sure, because that man has obviously been, you know, responsible for, you know, Watchmen and, and the, his run on Swamp Thing was absolutely incredible. Um, yeah. And what's I forget what that Superman That's was. our team actually is one of my favorites. And um, I'm interviewing later this week. I'm interviewing Steve Bissett, you know, who's oh, a yep. on that. And um, I, I can't wait because that guy's a huge wow. inspiration. Yeah, that's that's something that like I, I had read a lot of that when I was a kid, but I didn't like fully appreciate it. Cause it's at first, it seems like it's just going to be, you know, cause there was like the Swamp Thing thing cartoon and, you know, he can get kind of cartoony, but there's so much going on with well, everything. Especially when Alan Moore, cause he, he basically, he, he took a script and he talks about this. He's like, yeah. he took a script and there's not too much to it. She's like, you know what? I'm going to basically rewrite the entire character and create yeah, a whole new sure. backstory behind it. And For he did, sure. and, it, and it went from being like a title that is almost canceled to one of their best sellers. Well, it was, you know, a more generic, like a um, a man who has become a plant and he flipped it to a plant thinking it's human. Exactly. But it's, yeah. It has like delusions of being human. And that's the sad part is that it technically like was never human. It right. just has these memories of what is it, Alec Holland is that his name um Alex but, Holland yeah yeah but he was never human and that's like the great tragedy of it and he never will be um but to get that from such a simple you know kind of like uh, a Frankenstein -y type plot or like the fly type plot where like there's an accident standard superhero stuff where there's an accident and someone is you know permanently disfigured or changed um to flipping it and thinking it's that there's something far more in depth and you know the yeah really yeah. makes you think yeah it's so good so that's that's crazy with this i mean that's awesome yeah no he, he's very clever like i said i highly recommend his seminar yeah all right so um is there anything else you want to do to promote yourself uh way people can get a hold of you they can look at your work look at what you're you're up to these days 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm on Twitter pretty frequently. I would say like that or Instagram are pretty easy to get in touch with me. I don't check Facebook that much anymore um, because I think that most people could use a character limit and some of those statuses and people need to calm down. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I have a website. Do you do TikTok? But... Do no, I do not. Do I don't do TikTok. Tutu, you know, do the dances? No, I don't. I'm trying to start like a new, you know how there was the Tide Pod Challenge? I'm trying to figure out like what the next evolutionary thing for that is. But until I think of it, I'm going to stay off TikTok because that's kind of my, going to be my, my, my you grand. Remember the, the Ice Bucket Challenge? I remember that. Uh, one of my favorite ones is when people would do like uh, prank people and they would fill the bucket with ice cubes instead. <laughs> and the person wouldn't know. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not on TikTok. Uh, but I, I, you know, Twitter is probably the most I check that. I've tried to like step back a little bit from social media just for my own like sanity. But I'm, I'm on there at least like once a day checking stuff. And anybody who like asks me or, you know, mentions one of my books or something, I always um, try and respond for sure. So. Okay, awesome. And so you're hopefully what you're working on right now is going to be made to movie and make a ton of fucking money off of it. Uh, movie, uh, comic, miniseries, uh, sequels, clothing line, cologne line, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm.